Hi, everyone. Um, good morning. We're going to get started right now. Uh, this is Behavioral Health 201, the second session. Um, what you see up on the screen right here is uh, just a reminder about attendance and credit requirements. Um, if you are seeking CME, MOC, any continuing education credit, um, the after session surveys that you receive are required. Um, and then a new aspect for this course is we're going to do all attendance tracking on those after session surveys. So there is an attestation piece where you can say that you attended or you did not attend um, and you won't need to chat in or sign any sign in forms. Um, if you did not receive an after session survey after the first session, that means we don't have you registered. If you could just send me an email, um, I'm happy to register you um, and send you the surveys going forward. Um, additional information is also available in the syllabus that I sent out. Um, if there's any questions after reviewing the syllabus, just send me an email as well. Just some reminders about using Zoom for anyone logged in online. If you want to participate in the meeting, you can raise your hand, you can send a chat message. Um, any questions, feel free to chat me directly or send me an email. Um, if you'd like to be on video as well, this is how you start your video at the bottom left. Just click on the camera. Um, so our presenters for today, Jonas, do you want to introduce them? Yeah, and I just want to, before we really dive in, I just want to um, put in a few words for the uh, collaboration, the extensive collaboration we now have going with the ASAP program, um, you know, you, you've heard me say this before. I think for every one of us, this is becoming more and more, this substance use stuff is becoming more and more present in the patients and, and families that we're caring for in so many ways. We're, um, <clears throat> and this is becoming more and more important to our work. So there's a lot of collaboration going on, both in, in terms of uh, clinical integration uh, with the ASAP PC program, where we, it's a, uh, a, a, a fun, uh, SAMHSA funded grant project uh, that we have in collaboration with ASAP where we're integrating ASAP trained social workers right into primary care to address this right on the front lines and not have to refer these kids to specialty programs. There's also several research collaborations um, and uh, those projects always need participation from practice partners and um, you may have seen in the roundup recently uh, a notice about a NIDA funded study to revalidate uh, the S2BI and also compare it to some other substance use screening tools. Um, so if any of your practices are interested in, in, in joining this collaboration in a more participatory way, uh, reach out to me uh, in the roundup piece or some contact information on the ASAP end for who to contact, but please, uh, you know, th there's so many things that, uh, that we're doing that are uh, so central to you know, these significant issues that are are popping up day in, day out now uh, for most of us. Um, without further ado, I want to get us started and I want to introduce Dr. William Riccardelli, who's a, uh, who has the distinction of being uh, the, the only pediatric addiction medicine fellow in the country. ASAP uh, founded that fellowship a couple years ago. And uh, so we're very lucky to have uh, Bill with us now. Uh, Bill is a, trained as a child and adolescent psychiatrist. So he has that specialty uh, in addition to his uh, specialty in medicine. So without further ado, he's going to uh, talk to us about something uh, we're unfortunately all too familiar with, uh, vaping. Good morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Um, I'd like to thank Jonas and Jane for really helping organize this um, presentation this morning. And I'd like to thank everyone here for um, coming early this morning to listen to myself and Dr. Schizer speak about e-cigarettes and marijuana. These are um, things that kids are doing in houses, you know, all across America, and they're really, really, really a terrible um, problem that we're faced with. And I really appreciate you all coming to um, hear what we have to say this morning. So the title of my talk is E-Cigarettes as a Modern Day Trojan Horse. And when e-cigarettes arrived in this country, they were surrounded by an illusion of safety. In much the way the Trojan horse was seen as a gift, um, but at night the soldiers came out and they devastated the city of Troy, 
the same thing is happening now with e-cigarettes and we're just realizing all of the hazards that lie hidden inside of these devices. Okay. Yeah, I'm just having trouble advancing that slide. Oh, thank you. Click on this one. What is it? Click on this. Okay, thank you. Okay, so to go back. <laughs> so I I have no disclosures um, to, to reveal. Yep. Okay. Now it works. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Can you please mute yourself? We are hearing a lot of background noise. Thank you. Okay. So, is that better, everyone? Yeah, yeah, actually, it's much better for me, too. <laughs> Um, my objectives for today are to describe the neurobiology of nicotine addiction on the adolescent brain, to explain the adverse health effects of nicotine and vaping, and to list appropriate nicotine replacement therapies in youth. Okay, so e-cigarettes is an umbrella term. Um, there is great variability in the terminology in this area, and to a certain degree, you have to feel comfortable with that. Um, E-cigarettes fall into the um, general term of what's called ENDS, electronic nicotine delivery systems. And these um, devices all have several features in common. They're all battery powered. They all heat an e-liquid component until an aerosol is produced. And then that aerosol is inhaled, and that's the process that we call vaping. Um, now, what's the difference between an e-cigarette and a traditional cigarette? We traditionally call um, regular cigarettes combustible cigarettes. This is how they're referred to in the literature. And they're called combustible because there's a burning process. Combustible cigarettes involve the burning of tobacco. And when you burn the tobacco, you liberate the nicotine. The nicotine is a part of the tobacco plant. And you also release tar, ash, and toxic chemicals, okay? E-cigarettes, you're accessing the nicotine without any tobacco and without any tar. It's, it's an important distinction. This is how they were marketed as a harms reduction device because there's no tobacco and there's no tar, but there's still nicotine. This is um, talking about the mechanism of action. The battery heats a coil, and then the liquid is aerosolized when it contacts the heating element. Here, it explains the anatomy a little bit more clearly. Some of the e-cigarettes at the far end over here, they, they have a light, and that light might light up, but you can see the different components, the battery, um, the heating elements, and then the mouthpiece is, is where you inhale. So the liquid that um, is actually heated is referred to as e-liquid. Um, some people call it e-juice. And what's in the, the liquid? It could be a nicotine-containing solution, and that nicotine could be flavored, um, or it could be unflavored. It could be highly concentrated THC, and that is what um, people are now referring to as dab pens. The dab pens specifically refer when the THC is involved. Or the liquid can have neither nicotine or THC, and those are called blanks. This talk is going to focus on nicotine vaping. E-cigarettes do not smell like tobacco cigarettes. 
So someone will not have an odor on their hands, on their breath, on their clothing. The room is not going to smell like a, a cigarette smoker has been there. Sometimes there may be a transient smell of the sweet, fruity flavors um, if it's a flavored nicotine or a flavored blank. So there are thousands of um, e-cigarette devices available. All the way to the right are the devices that look more similar to um, traditional combustible cigarettes. Those are the first generation of e-cigarettes that became available. They were actually disposable. And over time, uh, you can see the, the technology has um, taken this to, to um, a, a, another level, actually. The devices um, next in line to the first generation, the rainbow-colored green one and the red one, those are called vape pens. Next to the vape pens are um, what would be called the dab pens. You can, you can put the uh, concentrated THC liquid in there. Th those are refillable. Next to that one, there's a box. That's called a mod system or a tank system. And it's um, been developed to produce much, much, much more dense clouds of vapor. People um, associate the denser cloud of vapor with more of a flavor sensation also. Um, if we keep moving along, we have an e-cigar, and then the last device is called an e-pipe. So over time, these devices have gotten extremely sleek and stylish, stylized. You'll see that two of them have a, what looks like a little LED screen. So these devices, they're, they're called also um, mod systems or tank systems. You can actually adjust the electrical resistance in them and alter how hot the heating elements get. And then by altering how hot the heating elements get, that also influences how the e-liquid is vaporized. So they're, they're customizable in a sense if someone wants to produce a very heavy, dense vapor, or if they, they, they want um, a, a lighter flavor profile. The one closest to me um, is shaped like a cell phone, right? It's, it's kind of very deceiving. There are e-cigarettes um, on vape devices that are now illuminated. So you can, you can start to see the, the potential lore for teenagers. I'm going back now to the device that looks like a cell phone and a pen. If I was to see these um, somewhere, I, I would really think that they might be a cell phone and a pen. So this is sort of an introduction to how kids are able to bring these devices into school and, and people are not realizing what they actually have on them. They're really deceptive, right? Yeah. So I haven't shown Juul yet, um, and that's because it gets its own slide. Um, <laughs> Juul is a, a small uh, electronic cigarette that's shaped like a, a USB flash drive. Atrius um, is part of the big five tobacco company, and they recently purchased 33% of the Juul business and that's elevated Juul to about a $35 billion um, market valuation. So that's why it also gets its own slide. Um, I have with me today a Juul device that I'm going to pass around. It has a cartridge inside of it already. Um, and I also have two vape pens. These are refillable pens. Um, I, I just think it's helpful. Your patients are using these things. So I think it's helpful to, to pass around. It, it may give you some insight. Um, I apologize to the online audience that, that these are for the in-house um, group only. OK. So there's something uh, going on nowadays called stealth vaping. And the cell phone falls under that category, the device that looks like a cell phone, some of the pens they, they really look like pens, but you can't write with them. 
We have other devices that look like asthma inhalers, car fobs, flashlights, TV remote controls. We also now um, have clothing. There's something called a vape hoodie. And you can see the strings, right? So there is an e-cigarette device in the strings. And kids have told us that they wear this to school and they're able to, to take a, um, a hit from the device when the teacher turns around. They might blow the smoke into, into their hands or into their backpack. Um, most schools today have what's called a jewel room. This is the same room that we called a bathroom when we were in high school. <laughs> and schools are really struggling with this. They're, they're taking the doors off of bathrooms. They're having bathroom monitors. They're putting devices up that can detect the vapor in the bathroom. So this is a little bit more information about the Juul. This is called a starter pack. It costs anywhere from $35 to $45. It comes with the device, that um, small metal piece to, to the right-hand side of it is actually how it's charged. And those are the nicotine pods. They come in different flavors. It's important to know clinically, one of those pods is equal to 200 puffs of a cigarette. Okay, so one cigarette, one traditional combustible cigarette is usually equal to um, about 20 puffs, I would say. Between 10 to 20 puffs is one cigarette. These pods are 200, cigar 200 puffs. So that, that equals about 20 cigarettes and that equals one pack of cigarettes. So I want you guys to think Going forward, one pod is equal to one pack of cigarettes. It's an important point because later on we're going to talk about nicotine replacement therapy, and I want you to remember a pod is equal to about a pack. Okay? They come in different percentages of nicotine. It could be a 3% or a 5% nicotine concentration. You can ask your patients if they're smoking Juul, is it a 3% or a 5% nicotine concentration? Some of the other e-cigarette um, liquids or the e-juices, the nicotine concentration can be 25%, 40%, 50%. It can be extremely high. Um, but, but for Juul, it could be 3 to 5%. This is how the Juul is charged. I, I find it fascinating. You can actually plug it into your cell phone and charge it. You can plug it into a laptop and charge it. There's a, a light on the jewel, and the light lights up for different reasons. It lights up if there's a problem with the battery. It lights up if it needs to be charged. And um, it lights up for one more reason. Juul was designed that the average inhalation be somewhere around three to five seconds. If the inhalation is longer than 10 to 12 seconds, it starts to blink. Kids nowadays are trying to do the longest inhalations that they can do and count how many times the light blinks. And they call that blinking, like a blinking competition. They'll, they'll try and have a, a very, very deep, long inhalation and count and see who can make it blink the most. This is um, something else that, that it's happening now. Um, people are wrapping these stickers around the e-cigarettes. It's illegal to market any of these devices to youth, um, but I leave it up to you to decide if this is really targeting adults, um, especially the superhero ones. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about e-liquids. There's over 7,000 types of e-liquids, okay? The e-liquid can be in the pod, and those pods are disposable. You don't reuse those pods. Or the e-liquid is um, in a cartridge. Some of the cartridges could be refillable or not. They come in many flavors. 
The flavors are sweet, dessert-like, and they often lure um, young people. The flavors do one other thing. They take away the naturally bitter flavor that's inherent to the nicotine. That's another really important point. Nicotine on its own is a bitter um, chemical. The flavors make it much more palatable. That's dangerous because the bitterness of nicotine is like the rate limiting step usually or the rate limiting factor to how much someone will um, ingest or, or use. They, they may feel that the flavor is so unpleasant that they might stop at a certain point. With the flavors, it takes away that like natural stop gap and they smoke more and that really, really gets them into a, a level where they can get what we call nick sick, nicotine sick, that's what the kids are calling it, nick sick, or they can develop like a nicotine toxicity. And they, previously they would have stopped if it was just that bitter flavor. But now that that bitter flavor has been masked, they go on and go on until they get sick. Here we have um, a, a variety of several more types of e-liquids. Um, you can see, you can uh, smoke a, a beer flavored e-liquid. You could smoke a gummy bear flavor. You could smoke a Red Bull flavor. Um, this is a survey from the National Institute of Drug Abuse where they asked adolescents, do you know what's in your um, e-cigarette in your e-cigarette juice? 66% of them said um, they believe it's just flavor, right? So they really, really don't know what, what they're smoking. And you know what? I don't blame them because when you have videos like this on YouTube talking about how to make your own e-liquid, I wouldn't know what's in it either. This is an actual clip from the video. It, it, it's really scary, right? I can see some faces in the audience. I, I don't know if you can see, but the two small bottles with the white labels, that's a strawberry and a banana flavoring. Each, each of those bottles is a, a flavoring that was designed to, to be in food and to be digested. It was never designed to interface with lung parenchyma. Just um, two days ago, uh, I was with Dr. Schizer and we were seeing a young man and he was proudly telling us that he makes his own e-liquid. Um, there have been several fatalities in young children when they've obtained the e-liquid from um, you know, the, the, the environment. There's a few things to um, know here. Nicotine in these solutions is absorbable through the skin, first of all. So if it spills or something and the kids come in contact with the, the, the chemical, it can be absorbed through the skin. Um, here, this is a chart from um, the National Poison Control Center that's tracking the number of um, ER uh, reported cases of kids that have been exposed uh, through e-liquid. About 80% of um, these admissions, there's about um, 2,800 2, admissions or something, ER visits, about 80% of them have been in kids that have been under six years old. And if you see the number kind of peaks around 2015 and it starts to decline, um, around 2015, around that time, legislation was uh, enacted that uh, required some of the states to start making the e-liquid containers childproof. So, so, so that's the reason that the number started to decline. The U.S. Surgeon General um, has declared vaping a national epidemic among adolescents. In 2018, one in five high school students and one in 20 middle, middle school students um, were using e-cigarettes. 
So this is the percentage of middle and high school students who use ends, who, who are smoking um, e-cigarettes. And you can see in 2017, the rate has increased dramatically. There's been over a 70% increase in high school students um, from 2017 to 2018. That's the dark dotted line that's under the solid line. Does anyone know what happened in 2017? Okay. In 2017, the jewel was released. The National Academies of Science, um, Engineering, and Medicine in 2018 has declared that there's substantial evidence that e-cigarette use increases the risk of using combustible tobacco cigarettes among youth who never used combustible cigarettes before. It's also published that among youth who use e-cigarettes and traditional combustible cigarettes, there's evidence that e-cigarette use increases the frequency and intensity of the combustible cigarette use. This is a picture of a teenage brain. I say it's a very PG teenage brain, um, but I'm going to change gears a little bit and talk about adolescent brain development for um, a brief uh, period. So this is some functional um, imaging of brains through different uh, times at the life cycle. The um, brain all the way to the uh, end of the slide is five years old, and the brain closest to me is a 20-year-old um, brain. This is uh, somewhat incomplete because we know adolescent brain development now goes on until the good um, end of your your, your um, 20s. So, so this is um, providing like, like a sample, but it's not complete. The dark colors, the purple and the blue, they indicate mature brain tissue or mature areas of the brain. We know that the brain matures from the posterior region to the frontal region, right? The frontal region is where we have our frontal lobe where we do decision making, where we have impulsivity, where we um, have our sense of control. <clears throat> so what I just said is the front part of the brain is the last part of the brain to mature and the front part of the brain is where we make our decisions, okay? So that's what this slide is showing and you can kind of see even at 20 years old, there are still some areas that are not purple and blue. We know that structures undergoing development are most vulnerable to toxins, right? So if there was an environmental insult, which structure do you think would be most vulnerable? That's how I want you to think of the teenage brain. It's a structure undergoing <coughs> development and it's being exposed to a storm of toxins, okay? So it's more vulnerable than a fully developed adult brain. And I think this is, is, a, is a really um, visual way to, 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 to understand that. While I was preparing for this talk, um, I read a study that was done um, over 20 years ago. And the study was going to look at how um, rats' lungs were affected by inhaling nicotine vapors. So the researcher on the first day of the study came into the, the, the examining um, you know, research area, and he had a cage of all of these animals, all of these, um, I think it was mice, because they were smaller, and they were running around. He had to pick up the mice, and he had to put them in these very narrow tubes so that they couldn't move. And then they passed, their, their little snouts would be sticking out of the tube, and they passed the nicotine vapor. <laughs> We have a request. Can you please mute um, the the audience that's named the West? No, we are the West. Oh. <laughs> can, can everyone please mute their um, devices on their end? So I was saying that they they were going to insert these little 
um, mice into these very narrow tubes, these very restrictive tubes, so the mice couldn't move and they would pass the nicotine vapor where their snouts were sticking out. On the first day, it was very hard to get the mice in the tubes. They, they resisted. They were biting the researchers very, very hard. On the second day, the researcher came into the um, area and he picked up the tubes and he put the tubes in the enclosure with the mice and the mice ran into the tubes willingly on their own. Uh, it speaks about, after one exposure, it speaks about how powerfully addictive nicotine is. This um, talks about the nicotine um, cycle. And we start at about 7 o'clock where someone smokes a cigarette. In 7 to 10 seconds, nicotine reaches their brain. That's an important number to remember. They instantly feel pleasure and relief. Within 20 to 30 minutes, the nicotine levels fall. They drop so much that the smoker starts to feel discomfort and they start craving and then they start another cigarette and this is how the cycle goes on and on. Nicotine works on the reward pathway. In addiction medicine, we talk a lot about the reward pathway in the brain the center of the reward pathway is the nucleus accumbens. And that's the, the red um, circle with the little yellow dots in this picture. All addictive substances work on the nucleus accumbens. They all work on the reward pathway. They all have a, a, a similar underlying um, way of working on the reward pathway. They release dopamine. That dopamine works on neural circuits and then travels to different parts of the brain. One of the main circuits is the circuit to the um, prefrontal cortex. So the dopamine receptors are activated, a flood of dopamine is released, it travels to the prefrontal cortex, and that's where it, Im it affects impulsivity, decision-making, mood control. Nicotine has short-term stimulant properties. It acts, like I said, on the dopaminergic receptors and the reward pathway. It also acts on um, other systems in the brain, serotonin and glutamate receptors. Um, I mentioned that the nicotine in 10 seconds reaches the brain already, and it lasts about 30 minutes. It's extremely addictive. It has an addictive um, index score that's similar to cocaine and heroin. In the long term, nicotine will impair attention and memory, and it's also associated with mood disorders and poor impulse control. And that makes sense if it's working over time on the frontal lobe. Okay. Nicotine works on acetylcholine nicotinic receptors, specifically the alpha-4, beta-2 receptors. Um, this slide, if you start all the way furthest from me, over here. Okay. That's the nicotinic receptor at its resting potential, and it has like a V shape. When someone has a cigarette, the receptors open. They change their conformation a little bit. They release dopamine. When the cigarette finishes, the receptor doesn't go back to the before cigarette conformation. The receptor is altered. It's now altered and at a resting um, potential. That altered receptor is going to multiply. You can see that in the middle slide. Over time, as the altered receptors multiply, they lead to increased cravings. So the more altered receptors there are, the higher the cravings. We call this upregulation of the receptors and we only see this with really one other addictive substance, opioids. Opioids have a similar mechanism of upregulating the receptor and um, causing cravings in the way biologically that this happens with nicotine.
so nicotine works on many, many parts of the body. Um, I'm just going to, to point out some um, effects that I think are especially relevant. <clears throat> it's associated with increased um, blood clotting, atherosclerosis, tremor, um, insulin resistance, nicotine intoxication, right? This is when I say the kids talk about feeling nick sick, they get nauseous, they may have diarrhea, they can get dizzy, they can have headaches, um, they have changes in their sleep, they have um, unpleasant dreams. It's um, associated with arrhythmias, tachycardia, coronary artery disease, Okay. This is a, a study that was done on about 500 young adults between 18 to 25 years old. Um, it was published in the Journal of Addiction Medicine in 29, May 2019, and they compared the sleep scores on the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index. It's a sleep rating scale. They compared the scores um, of how various substances affected these young adults' sleep. Um, the substances were coffee nicotine, cocaine, and energy drinks. They um, found out that nicotine had the greatest negative impact on sleep. Now you're probably saying, well, cocaine, you know, keeps <laughs> people awake for days. So what's going on here? They, they showed that people that when they did cocaine, they weren't um, expecting to fall asleep after they did cocaine. Or when they did cocaine, they did cocaine knowing that they would be able to, to not sleep. So they, they had adjusted their um, routines. But nicotine, people were smoking cigarettes while they were in bed getting ready to fall asleep. So it kind of, like, in a way, it had the greatest functional impairment because they didn't believe that it would have those effects. In addiction, um, we talk about intoxications and we talk about withdrawal. Generally, I want you to think that a withdrawal symptom is going to be the opposite of the intoxicating effects. So I was saying with um, Nick sick, when the kids get Nick sick, they can have diarrhea, they can have um, vomiting. The withdrawal symptom is the opposite. They have a decrease in intestinal motility. They can um, actually be constipated. Withdrawal is associated with very strong cravings with mood changes, with fatigue, um, with hunger. This is another clear example where the withdrawal is an exact opposite of the intoxication, right? With intoxication, they have lack of appetite with nicotine. The withdrawal, they get hunger. This is why um, people are, are either partly worried about stopping smoking or they gain weight when they uh, stop smoking. Um, the toxicity of nicotine is, is a separate phenomenon from the intoxication. The intoxication, you're, you're feeling ill, you're um, having some negative effects. The, the toxicity is you're having life-threatening effects. You're, 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 we've seen people through vaping high doses of nicotine at the adolescent addiction clinic who have actually had seizures from vaping. Um, they can have respiratory depression from <coughs> nicotine toxicity. Arrhythmias, bradycardia, hypotension. The, the toxicity, this is when they're having like life-threatening doses. Say there's been an ingestion of the liquid or something like that. What's in the vapor? The vapor has many, many um, elements. Some we know about, some we still don't know about. They have found carcinogenic chemicals in the vapor. Um, they've found diacetyl, which has been linked to uh, um, popcorn lung, which is bronchiolitis obliterans. And there are also heavy metal particles. Um, that jewel that I passed around is metal. So when the heating element heats up the e-liquid, it also heats up the device. As the device is being heated, nanoparticles of the metal are being released. They're microscopic particles. When people inhale, they're inhaling the vapor. They're also inhaling the nanopar nanoparticles of the metal device. 
This is going to the lungs and to other end organs. Bronchiolitis obliterans, I just mentioned associated with the diacetyl flavoring in the e-cigarette liquids. Um, this is a process where the small end airways, the small end vessels in the lungs, they first become inflamed. That inflammation leads to scarring. Um, okay. Some side effects of vaping. It tends to dry out the mouth. Uh, people are talking about vapor's tongue. They lose their sensation to perceive um, flavors they might not taste, foods might lose their taste. The actual e-liquids, they, they stop um, perceiving the taste of the e-liquids themselves. Also associated with an increase in um, nosebleeds. Okay. Um, so all across the country, there has been this um, epidemic of the vaping-linked lung injuries. Uh, this is in the media every single day. The statistics change every two or three days. So no clear causative agent has been found um, at this time. We, we really do not know what's going on. And it is a heterogeneous group of lung injury patterns. It's not one pattern. So some of the lung injury looks like chemical burns. Some looks like a pneumonitis. Some looks like an atypical pneumonia. Some looks like um, an eosinophilic pneumonia. It's a, it's a very, very, very varied group of lung pathology that we're seeing. Um, what's important for us to take to the outpatient level is one of the presenting signs that we're seeing is fatigue with exertion, decreased exercise tolerance, and shortness of breath. So I want you to think of your high school athletes, your star athletes that are in really, really, really fit shape, and all of a sudden they can't run across a football field. It's a really obvious change. Um, this, there, there, there's more to this slide that's not showing up for some reason. But the CDC has um, termed this lung injury EVALI, e-cigarette or vaping-associated lung injury. There are four criteria that they're working with right now to establish a diagnosis of EVALI. Someone should be previously healthy with no significant past medical history to explain the respiratory symptoms. They should have vaped within the past 90 days. They should have... Um, Changes on chest imaging, opacities, effusions, um, and the workup should be a very thorough, full infectious workup, often involving a bronchoscopy, and that should be negative for infectious causes. Those four criteria meet the um, diagnosis of Ivali. And this is out of an article that was just released in September in the New England Journal of Medicine. Oh, here we go, previously healthy. Um, they should have smoked in the past 90 days, changes on imaging, and the workup has to be negative. Um, here's some imaging. This is a 17-year-old boy who has um, what, what we're calling a volley. I, I put a black background so you guys can really clearly see the, the changes. Okay. Um, this was released by the CDC on October 8th. Um, we have cases now in every single state except Alaska. There have been over 1,480 cases of this Avali lung illness. There have been 33 deaths. The youngest death was in New York in a 17-year-old, and he was previously healthy. Some patients are being hospitalized twice. They're being discharged, they're returning to vaping, and they're being hospitalized a second time. We're also not sure if there is um, a component of immune um, dysfunction with this illness that's predisposing them to um, a, a second occurrence. We're really not sure. Um, there are more and more harms of e-cigarettes. Uh, explosions and burns is a whole entire other category. There have been several thousand ER visits due to explosions and burns. 
I think some of my slides speak for themselves. This is another one. Um, here, the, the device exploded as, as someone was holding it up to their mouth. It, it was a very complicated fracture. There have been deaths from the explosions. Um, actual pieces of the plastic or metal have been embedded in the skull, have severed vessels, engulfed the bedroom in flames. I'm speeding up a little bit because I want to get to um, the nicotine replacement therapy, but I'm going to just mention, I, I said the kids are doing very deep inhalations. This is what they are also doing with the inhalations. They're doing what's called vape tricks. And there's um, this movement called competitive vaping. And there are vape influencers online. But this is really, really, really luring the kids. Kids think this is really cool. They never um, smoked anything before. They see someone doing this and they want to replicate it. Um, with regular cigarettes, you know, people usually have an inhalation. It's a, a, a certain amount. It goes down to the lungs and they release it. What, what's happening now is they're changing the pattern that they inhale, and it's called direct to lung. And you can see it increases the time that the respiratory tra um, epithelia is exposed to the smoke, right? It's dangerous. Okay. These are some more tricks. This trick is called the dragon. There are tutorials online that teach kids how to do tricks. Um, the FDA has not evaluated e-cigarettes as a device for smoking cessation yet. So there's very little factual data that e-cigarettes actually help with smoking cessation. Um, I'm going to forward to nicotine replacement therapy a little bit right now. So you should be asking all of your um, patients, you know, we like to ask everyone to quit at every visit. We, we find out if they've been smoking and we challenge them. We ask them if they're interested in, in quitting. We advise them for health reasons why they should quit. We ask them where they are in um, like a, a scale of one to 10 about wanting to, to never smoke again. And then the um, fourth A is assist. We want to assist them. Here's where we give treatment and we arrange follow-up. It's very important to have uh, follow-up either by phone or in person. Nicotine replacement therapy comes in three um, forms that are appropriate for adolescents. Patches, lozenges, and gums. There is a nicotine spray and a nicotine inhaler, but these are not recommended for adolescents. The studies have shown that it was um, too difficult for the adolescents to manipulate the spray or the inhaler, and they, they um, did not um, show to be more effective than placebo. So for adolescents, patches, lozenges, or gums, the literature shows lozenges have a higher um, success rate for teenagers than gums. And these come in flavors also. So they might say, you know, I don't like the flavor of the lozenge. There's several flavors. They can try a different flavor. Um, for the gum, there's a method called the park and uh, chew method. You might have heard of this. So they put the gum in their mouth. They chew it a little bit until they notice the, the peppery taste. And they park it in between their jaw and their cheek. And they leave it there until that like unpleasant peppery flavor taste goes away. Then they chew it a little bit more. Okay, it's important to tell them that. They shouldn't just chew it and chew it and swallow. They should park it over here um, between their cheek and their jaw. The nicotine is absorbed in the mouth through, through the skin. Um, the gum, we give the gum on a, a PRN basis. So nicotine replacement therapy really ideally should be a long-acting form of nicotine replacement therapy and a short-acting form of nicotine replacement therapy simultaneously. So the patch is the long-acting form. You want to apply it to a smooth part of the body where there is no hair. You want to change position every day like any other patch delivery system. You get skin irritation sometimes. Um, we advise to apply in the morning, hold it down for 10 seconds. They can try to sleep with it on. Uh, a good percentage of people develop nightmares if they sleep with the patch. 
In that case, then they would take it off before they go to bed and reapply it in the morning. Some people don't get nightmares. Um, when they throw it out, they should fold it in half by putting the two sticky ends together. Um, because if, if someone is to, to access it, they can still get nicotine from that sticky side and then they should wash their hands. And this is really just uh, showing, we really want to move it around to avoid that um, irritation. It comes in different dosages. There's a 21 milligram patch, a 14 milligram patch, and a seven milligram patch. There's no exact science to this. Different people do this different ways. Um, generally, if someone is smoking um, half a pack to uh, a pack a day, you want to start them on either a 14 milligram or a 21 milligram patch. Things that go into maybe using the higher milligram dose would be how long they've been smoking, how many pack years they have, how many um, quit attempts they have. Um, also, how long is it before they have their first cigarette in the morning? If they tell you they don't have their first cigarette until 11 o'clock in the morning, that's someone that, that might have an easier time quitting than someone who has the first cigarette while they're still in bed. It's a very powerful index um, for cigarette smokers to show the level of um, like physical dependence. What's also important from this slide is you want to, over a period of uh, several weeks, gradually decrease the dose of the patch. So this would be someone who initially starts with a 21 milligram patch and a short acting form of nicotine replacement therapy, like a gum or a lozenge, and they can use the gum or lozenge every two to three hours. They can have six, seven, eight pieces of gum or lozenge a day, right? We wanna use it liberally. They're craving, the patch is gonna take away a lot of the craving, hopefully, but there's gonna be breakthrough cravings. That's when then they supplement with the PRN. And over time, we decrease the patch, but we continue to give the, the PRN oral form. And then once the patch is stopped, we would slowly wean them off of the oral form. Okay. Um, so before I had mentioned one Juul pod is equal to one pack of cigarettes, right? So if someone is smoking a pod a day, I would give them a 21 milligram patch. There, this is really new territory. There are no guidelines for treating um, nicotine use disorder in uh, e-cigarette smokers. So, so this is something that we're um, clinically, you know, figuring out as, as, as we are faced with this problem. Yes. So if someone's smoking two or three pods a day, two or three packs a day, I would probably give them two um, patches a day. I would not go above two patches a day, 42 milligrams of nicotine. I, I would um, send them home on the two patches a day. I would check in with them in a few days. If they're still having problems um, where the two patches a day is not enough, I would not go higher. I would, I would recommend that you talk to someone who has experience in addiction. And that's a perfect, perfect, perfect um, point to go to this slide because this is pharmacotherapy for nicotine addiction, right? So for some people, the nicotine replacement therapy is not enough. And we have two medications that have evidence for smoking cessation. Bupropion, this is um, an antidepressant. It's a... Um, atypical antidepressant that works on dopamine and norepinephrine reuptake. It's marketed as Wellbutrin for depression and anxiety. It's the same exact chemical, same exact drug that's marketed under Zyban for smoking cessation. Um, things to know about uh, Zyban, it is a very strong and potent <laughs> um, modulator of the seizure threshold. It lowers the seizure threshold. So this is really, really contraindicated in people that have an uncontrolled seizure disorder, that have an eating disorder, where they're predisposed to electrolyte abnormalities that are going to um, affect the seizure threshold. I would not give it with other medications that also work on the seizure threshold. It's a great medication when it's used properly. Um, 
people, when they overdose on this medication, they have seizures. So, so um, I, I, I just put all of that out there. Shantix. The evidence for Shantix is great in adults, in, in people over 18. In adolescents under 18 years old, it did not show to be more effective than placebo. So for your younger adolescents, I would not consider Shantix. Um, again, Shantix is another medication that lowers the seizure threshold. I would not prescribe these two together. There are some um, reports in the literature where people do give them together. I myself wouldn't. Um, also, Shantix is contraindicated with pregnancy. This is an algorithm that I worked on um, about smoking cessation. And actually, you guys in the PPOC are going to get this algorithm. It's going to be available to you. We're just um, in the final stages of um, making one or two last minute edits. So you're not going to have it today, but you will have it soon. Um, I'm only going to point out the first few boxes ask your patients if they're having decreased exercise tolerance. Okay? These, these um, patients with this pulmonary illness, they're definitely in all, um, you know, the, the communities, people are not asking these questions, so they're not being detected. So I recommend that's what you start. Are you smoking? Are you vaping? First thing, if you don't have time for anything else, are you having decreased exercise tolerance? Are you um, getting weak after exercise, shortness of breath? Um, we can monitor nicotine in the urine. So this is really helpful to determine a person's pattern of use. Um, cotinine is the metabolite that we test for. And we can actually get a quantitative number. We can see from week to week if they're having higher or lower um, you know, uh, ingestion of nicotine. If you're giving nicotine replacement therapy, that nicotine replacement therapy will show up in the testing. So when we're giving NRT, we don't follow the nicotine levels. But if someone is not on nicotine level and they're trying to um, you know, say they stopped and we want to monitor that they continue to be abstinent, then we do the cotinine testing. Um, yeah, go ahead. How long it lasts in the urine? It lasts for one to three days in the urine. Yeah, it has, it has to be recent. And we're seeing all sorts of things that are hard to interpret clinically. Like we're seeing very low levels and we're not sure if that's secondhand exposure or if someone might have just had one hit on the device or if that's kind of the tail end of the nicotine leaving their system. It's, it's um, hard to interpret. It's an emerging science. There's no evidence and real information uh, on this. Um, I have several resources I'm, I'm just going to mention. The AAP has an excellent, excellent site on um, electro electronic cigarettes. The National Institute on Drug Abuse, NIDA, this is a phenomenal website. They have uh, specific pages for parents, specific pages for teachers, and specific pages for teenagers. And they're really, really, really developmentally geared towards teens. They're excellent resources. Um, the Surgeon General Report has a lot of printable information and very easy to read information for parents and families. The Graykin Center, um, families can call this number 844-319-5999 and speak to um, uh, addiction counselor anytime. Uh, Stanford has a very, very good educational uh, series of web pages. And this is PAVE, Parents Against Vaping. It's a group of mothers um, from Manhattan that have taken uh, education and advocacy for e-cigarettes extremely seriously. They've uh, lobbied at, in, in, in Washington. And um, this is our clinic, the Adolescent Substance Use and Addictions Program at Boston Children's. We've been there for over 20 years. We're the first pediatric addiction program in the country. Um, and we are happy to accept all of your referrals. Um, okay. Um, okay, questions? Yeah, hi. What's the legality of, what's the legality of kids getting the, 
patches? Do we need prescriptions? Can they buy them under 18? Thank How you. you. Thank you. There's that? so much to mention, and I, I didn't mention this, and I do want to comment on this. So um, for patients that are under 18 years old, the pharmacies really will not sell them nicotine replacement therapy. They'll sell it to their parents, so we prescribe it for under 18. Okay? It's really good to prescribe to even over 18, but they can purchase it in the pharmacies. Um, under 18 years old, you require a prescription. Um, with the van, is there a microphone? Hello? Okay. Um, so the ban, right? The ban went into effect September 24th, 2019 for four months. It's a temporary ban. And the purpose of the ban is to acquire more information. Um, part of the ban is the complete ban of all e-cigarettes and all e-cigarette paraphernalia. This is for nicotine and for THC, flavored, non-flavored. It includes retail and online. Everything is banned. Is it um, preventing everyone from smoking? No, kids are going to New Hampshire, kids are getting stuff from out of state, but it's definitely, definitely having um, an effect and people are smoking less. Part of the ban, one of the stipulations is, it gives pharmacists the ability to charge um, insurance companies for over-the-counter nicotine replacement therapy. So it's given pharmacists the ability to prescribe nicotine replacement therapy so they can submit that claim to the insurance companies. Yeah. Questions? I talk a lot and it was a lot of information to cover and I apologize that I ran over. Yeah. Go ahead. Does a tank always have THC in it? No, no. They could be the tanks could so be those big fat ones. They could be nicotine sol solution, and um, I've seen a lot of instances where people are smoking very high nicotine content, like thirty, forty percent nicotine okay. in those big boxes. Yeah. So I have a kid who said he, he was smoking five tanks a day. Wow. I and he couldn't breathe, and I sent him to pulmonology. Yeah. That day. Th th that that um, uh, perfect. You couldn't have done a better job. Um, and we're seeing really, really, really extreme um, situations like this where when they come in and they tell us this, we're speechless and we're horrified and, and we act quickly. So very well done. Yeah. About the cotinine yeah. uh, urine test, I gather that it's probably not the right thing to do to order such a test for a parent who says, can you do, can you do some tests to make sure my kid's not vaping, which has come up. Before. So um, I, we could probably give a whole presentation on drug testing. Um, since I've started working in the addiction clinic, I have realized how complicated it is. There are so many issues. We have a, a really beautifully, very um, elaborate, well-designed system for drug testing. Um, I think when you're um, going to work with a family on drug testing, you should have them in first probably to counsel them before the testing. You want to talk to the kid before the test happens. We, we have a, a very um, nice policy. Uh, Dr. Schizer, would you like to say something about that? Now, we actually have a session on drug testing in January, so we'll talk for longer. The American Academy of Pediatrics is very specific about not testing adolescents covertly. Um, and so parents are going to put you in that position. They're going to ask you to, you know, just check your urine and the kid will think you're checking it for someone else. But that really is considered a no-no, particularly since what do you do with the information when you get it? Like, how do you talk to the adolescent about it if he didn't know you were even, he or she didn't know you were getting it? So great question. Uh, January, we'll talk a lot more. Thank you. Hi, go ahead. I'm wondering if um, Jewel makes a flavor-only pod. Or do they all have nicotine? Not to my knowledge. Okay. Um, I, I, I believe I've been to the vaping stores before the ban, and I, I, I believe they do not. I wasn't believing that. Yeah. No. So, like I said, they're now owned by Atrio, and that's part of uh, – they own Philip Morris, which is one of the big five tobacco companies. They have a financial interest in getting people, you know, to smoke nicotine. They, if they, they would have to have a whole new, you know, branch. They might, but they don't now. 
I also welcome questions from the online group. Please um, chime in. Anyone else? Questions, comments, thoughts? Go ahead. Not, not, not yet. Not yet. We have not seen that clinically. We actually were just talking one or two days ago that we haven't seen combustible cigarette smokers, um, you know, that, that frequently. Yeah, but I think it's a great question. I think we're going to have to wait and see. You know, what, what Bill explained is that um, generally cigarette use had been on the decline for adolescents. And now we're not sure what's going to follow if kids can't access these devices, what's going to happen. Um, but what's a really profound point is this idea of using these devices for smoking cessation is upside down in adolescence. You know, kids who aren't using anything are now using nicotine this route. So that was a long answer for we just don't know what's coming. We haven't seen it yet, but all bets are off. And I would say I, I believe everyone knows this, but I don't feel like I'm being thorough unless I, I really clearly say it. Um, it is absolutely contraindicated to ever recommend an e-cigarette device to an adolescent as a smoking cessation treatment. So if they are smoking cigarettes, never recommend e-cigarette um, use to adolescents. Um, we would go the nicotine replacement therapy or, or you know, the, the other ways because the evidence shows that they increase, um, you know, cigarette use with the, the e-cigarettes. And we just have a question from online, Bill. Online question. Go ahead. Um, if someone has asked, do you recommend the QuitWorks program? Is the QuitWorks um, one of the programs that has the text um, features on the telephone where they get text messages and support? Um, just seeing the response here. Do you know that program? Quit. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah all of those are relevant. Okay. All of those are helpful. Yeah. So those could be extremely helpful and we do recommend them. Yeah. Uh, they said it's the program through the state. Yes, definitely. The, the Massachusetts State has a wonderful program. Um, families can just call the quit line and be connected to someone and um, you know, receive a lot of resources. Um, we have another question. Um, I need some clarification. What are they doing about the THC products? Not so the, the ban includes all of um, vaping, which inc includes the THC products as well. Um, really, we, we're, we're mystified at what, what is in the THC products and how it's affecting people, um, but, but it's, it's covered by the ban. I'm not certain what else, um, you know, the, question, the, the, the questioner is, is um, interested in finding out about the THC products, but it's included in the ban. Great. Thank you. Just very quickly before we move into the next presentation, I want to remind everybody that uh, we've established a consult line with ASAP and you should all know that number and we'll send it out again. Um, and that consult line is to provide guidance on anything, you know, initiation of, uh, you know, nicotine use all the way up to, you know, it's not just for questions about serious, you know, drug and substance use, anything. All this content we talked about today, you can get guidance from a senior physician at ASAP by calling that consult line. Okay. So that Trojan horse was from the Burning Man Festival. It was a real Trojan horse and um, I, I, it, it lights up and then they burn it. So I just think it's really um, <laughs> symbolic of my talk. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bill. All right, um, so that, I feel like we could go home now. We've learned so much <laughs> listening to you talk. So that last question about THC products was a perfect segue. We're gonna finish the session by talking about marijuana. So um, I like this talk, I've entitled it, The Teen Brain on Marijuana, What Every Practicing Clinician Should Know. I too have no disclosures. 
So I have uh, several objectives for the next few minutes. I'd like to introduce everyone to the current landscape, which is uh, changing at a rapid pace regarding legalization of marijuana across the country. Then I'd like to go over some of the nuts and bolts of marijuana use. And I always like to say so that you can speak the same language that your patients are speaking. Then I'm gonna zero in on four very common myths surrounding marijuana use. I can guarantee that everyone in this room is familiar with what these are. And then we're gonna look at the scientific evidence uh, why these aren't actually the case. Then we're gonna look at this phenomenon called medical marijuana. And then I'm gonna leave off, I think in a way with more questions than answers as we start trying to figure out what, what's gonna happen as more and more states legalize marijuana in various contexts. What lessons should we be learning um, as we try to figure this out? So as part of this talk over the last few years, I've always showed a map of the country where uh, the baseline is gray and then states pictured in green have some law on the books regarding marijuana legalization. And it's very obvious to me, particularly this year, how much more green my map of the United States is. So if you look at this map, um, the states that are pictured in the lighter green have legalized all use of marijuana, recreational use in adults 21 and over. Uh, the current count, I believe, is 11 states plus the District of Columbia. I think Illinois was the most recent um, over the last few months. And then the states that are pictured in the darker green have uh, laws enabling medical marijuana. And so again, I think, you know, if I come back next year, you'll see even more green than this. That's clearly been the trend. So our focus in this room is on adolescents and young adults. So really the million dollar question becomes, is this having an effect on adolescents? And so we've talked about the Monitoring the Future survey before. I think I brought it up in our expert session, which is a wonderful tool for people who do what I do. Um, we've had this data since 1975, about 50,000 nationally representative 8th, 10th, and 12th graders are surveyed, and they're asked very detailed questions about their substance use, A, their use, and B, their attitudes towards the substance use. So it gives us a lot of information, and it's a very powerful way to detect trends over the years. All right, so if you look at this slide, we're looking at data for monitoring the future all the way back since 1975. Um, and then these are 12th graders who were asked on one point, um, this is the language that's used, do they, do they believe that there's a great risk of harm associated with marijuana use? And you can see how, um, this is the line in blue, how that changes. Um, and so in the 80s, kind of culminating in the early 90s, there was an, a sense of increased risk, you know, more people thought it was harmful. And then that has been on the decline really since that peak around 1990. And you can see in recent years, there's been a significant decline. So we're now at an all time low, about 27% of survey 12th graders think that marijuana use is harmful, which means I'm doing the math. So 73% think that there isn't harm associated with use. So the other uh, curve that you're looking at is uh, 12th graders are also asked if they've used marijuana in the past 30 days, uh, our language for them would then be current users if you've used anything in the last month. And there's certainly a suggestion that these are mirror images of each other. And I think it makes sense. And we know this from other substances, you know, that often there's a phase where a substance is viewed as less harmful and that usually precedes an increase in use. And again, I think it's intuitive. I think it makes sense. All right, so now we're gonna talk about some of the nuts and bolts of marijuana. This is a picture of the cannabis sativa plant, which is a source of uh, marijuana. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with THC, which is Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol. Um, so we know that marijuana contains compounds, which we, are, we call them cannabinoids, um, and THC is the one that we know the most about. This is the primary psychoactive ingredient in marijuana. I think the point that I like to make is there are actually more than 100 other cannabinoid compounds in marijuana, some of which we know really very little or nothing about. All right, so THC is the primary psychoactive ingredient. We know that it's fat soluble, and this is an important property because as such, it's able to easily cross both the blood-brain barrier and the placenta. Um, we also know because it's lipophilic, it accumulates in adipose tissue. Again, we're gonna talk about drug testing in January, um, but we know that it tends to be stored or sequestered in adipose tissue, and so it can slowly kind of leak out of those sites and then affect a patient and also be uh, seen in the urine for an extended length of time. 
So we're going to talk about these um, endogenous cannabinoid receptors, which is the site that THC works. We know that these receptors are widely present in the central nervous system. All right, so um, how is marijuana used? Traditionally, over time, the most common method was to smoke um, some mixture of the dried buds and leaves. Remember, we looked at a picture of the plant. Um, we decided that Bill would go first because he gave you a, a fantastic introduction to vaping because we know that this is um, also now a very common way that marijuana is used uh, using similar um, devices that Bill um, explained to us in detail. We are seeing more use of uh, edibles over the last few years. I can tell you there's been a significant shift. Um, and so these are concentrated oils or resins from marijuana that can be added to any number of food products. Um, how many people are familiar with dabbing with that phrase? Oh, good, a good number. So if a patient tells you they're dabbing, typically that means that they're using hash oil, which is a very concentrated resin um, containing a lot of THC. So I'm glad a lot of you are familiar with that. All right, so uh, here's my little show and tell. I don't have anything in person uh, that Bill had. So the picture on the left, this is a joint. This is a classic marijuana cigarette. Um, who knows what the middle picture is, what, what that would be called? Perfect. A blunt, thank you. So uh, this is literally a hollowed out cigar in which the tobacco material is removed and marijuana is put in instead. I think a picture is worth a thousand words. There's a lot more marijuana in a blunt than in a joint. Um, who knows what the picture on the right is? Well, there's also nicotine, isn't there in the tobacco leaf? Yes, no, exactly. So you're also getting nicotine and, and the harmful effects of that. Excellent point. Picture on the right, any takers? Thank you. So that's a bong, um, and this is a water pipe used for the combustion of marijuana. Um, before the era of dab pens, a lot of our parents who would bring their child to ASAP would find out that their child was using marijuana when they would find a bong in the bedroom. I mean, that was a story that I heard all the time. So now, instead of hearing that much about bongs, we're hearing much more about dab pens, um, and the idea is that kids are using these vaporizing devices to use marijuana. Um, they tend to be very discreet. You don't have this characteristic odor of marijuana, so kids can, again, kind of hide in plain sight using their dab pen. I was going to say that these were touted as a healthful alternative because you're not generating the products of combustion. I think in the last few weeks that's probably receded because now we're seeing these obvious uh, health effects. I love this picture. I just want to share it. Um, I remember I had a parent who was being followed in ASAP. Her 15-year-old son had gone to sleepaway camp, and she was really kind of very hopeful that he wasn't going to use anything while he was there. And then sure enough, she found out that he was, and so she searched his possessions and took this picture. She had it on her phone, and she said, this is what I found. Um, and I think really the point of this slide is it's a different landscape, and you've got a very good sense of that from Bill. Um, parents just don't even know what they're looking at. Like these are very different looking paraphernalia than what parents would be finding, let's say 10 years ago. So I mentioned that we're seeing more edible use. You know, edibles are sold in dispensaries. Um, and so you see on the left, these are the traditional marijuana brownies, which I think is what traditionally we used to think about. But now we're seeing a variety of different food products that contain marijuana. And, and the packaging can be confusing. If you look at the products on the right, they look like other products, so you might not necessarily realize what you're eating. All right, let's talk about the acute effects of marijuana intoxication. We know that these are going to vary by person and by dose. Um, generally, if you're smoking or vaping marijuana, it reaches the brain within minutes. Um, peak effects are about 30 minutes after inhalation, and then the duration would be about two to four hours. It wouldn't surprise you that when someone is ingesting marijuana, it's a different time frame um, because something has to be, you know, it has to be digested. So typically these effects start later and then they have a longer duration of action. And I can tell you that patients often get into trouble trying to dose themselves using edibles. Uh, the classic story would be someone who's eating something, not feeling an effect, they keep eating, and then they, you know, it hits them like a Mack truck and they can have severe intoxication. So we're, we're hearing that story over and over again. In terms of the physiologic effects, we know that marijuana can cause an increase in heart rate, elevated blood pressure, although you see an orthostatic hypotension type of picture, bronchial relaxation, also dry mouth. I have patients tell me they drink a lot of water because of the dry mouth, and then conjunctival injection, which is the well-known red eyes phenomenon. 
So if you're talking to patients about marijuana, you got to understand why they're doing it. So I think it's fair to think about the positive effects reported by users. There's a wonderful phrase in the literature. I just love this phrase, calming euphoria. I think that's a really good description of what users are seeking. Um, A lot of individuals will report decreased anxiety in that moment, heightened perception, music sounds better. Um, Generally, patients feel or individuals feel more social. Um, There is this interesting sensation of time slowing, increased appetite, which we all know is the munchies, and then this subjective decrease in pain. So I'm going to spend a little more time today focusing on the negative effects, um, and these can include any of the following effects. Um, some patients feel paranoid after using marijuana. We always take kid, ask kids during our initial history if that's something they've experienced. Some kids feel an acute rise in their anxiety, irritability, um, and then these neurocognitive effects are well known. Uh, marijuana definitely causes impairments in short-term memory, changes in attention and judgment. Um, What you may not know is that it also affects coordination. So marijuana can cause poor coordination, distorted spatial perception, and altered awareness of time. And what's really important is that these neurocognitive effects can linger. So remember I told you two to four hours for effects, but a lot of these effects will still be on board up to 24 hours after use. And so I'd like you to spend a minute thinking about the young drivers in your practice who might, you know, kids will say, well, I waited two hours and then I drove, or I waited four hours. But meanwhile, a lot of these effects are still going to be operational, and perhaps the individual won't appreciate that. Um, So we're thinking a lot these days about potency of marijuana. That's the word that we use, which uh, tells us the percentage of THC in the marijuana product. And we know that this has changed dramatically over recent years. Um, And we know this because the DEA confiscates material and then assays. So we have good national data going back many years. So if someone were to smoke a joint in 1990, the average percentage of THC in that joint would be about 4%. So let's consider that a very low number. Fast forward to 2010, we're up to about 10%. I think it's more like 12 to 15% if we're going to the present day. And we keep mentioning, how many people in the room have heard of dab pens? Because I know I say that a lot. Okay, right, thank you. So we are up in that 80, 90% range when we're talking about potency in something like a dab pen. And what I'll tell you is a lot of our long-term studies looking at the effects of marijuana are done with you know, 4 or 5%. So we really don't know what the effects are going to be with these new products that are out there. And you know, we're obviously very nervous about that. One thing I can tell you is that there's been a significant increase in the number of emergency department visits from marijuana. Um, So there's a wonderful network called the National Drug Abuse Warning Network, DAWN, which uh, tracks ED visits across the country linked to use of an individual substance. And so we've seen a very significant uptick over the last few years in ED visits for marijuana. Um, Often these kids are presenting with severe psychiatric symptoms, paranoia, anxiety, aggressive behavior. Uh, You know, we don't think of marijuana traditionally as a hallucinogen, but kids can be having hallucinations. Um, How many people have heard of the hyperemesis syndrome? Okay, again, well, you guys really know a lot. Um, So cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome, I have a separate slide about that, CHS. We don't really understand it, but it's the syndrome where um, typically regular or heavy marijuana users present with vomiting. They can't stop vomiting. They often get these million dollar GI workups as this unfolds. And then when everything else is negative, the conclusion is that this is from cannabis. And the only cure that we know of at this point is to stop using. And the one clue, if you're ever taking a history, is the only time they feel better is when they're taking a shower. So it's, I've seen it in the literature is that cannabis shower syndrome, you know, they talk about compulsive bathing because that's really the only time that, that um, patients experience relief. So I've alluded to the fact that there's an endogenous cannabinoid system. Um, Anandamide is kind of a chemical cousin to THC, and we know that there's an established set of receptors that bind anandamide, and that's where THC binds. Um, So these receptors were discovered. We have several years of science looking into this system. I think in the late 80s, they discovered these cannabinoid receptors in the brain, and then anandamide was identified in the early 90s. I'm told that that's the Indian word for bliss, anandamide. 
So a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, you're looking at the brain in cross section. Everywhere you see a purple dot is where THC binds in the brain. Really, the take home of, of this slide is wow, that's a lot of purple dots. And you could see that a, a kind of a large percentage of the brain is involved. What is always interesting to point out is you'll notice there are no purple dots in the brainstem, uh, and that is why we don't see overdose deaths with marijuana the way that we do with opioids. We don't see the respiratory depression picture. So um, there's a lot of work going on to what this endocannabinoid system does. I think the best explanation that's out there is it's like a volume control system. That looks like an old radio dial. Um, and so ne when neuronal activity is exaggerated or too much, this system works on modulating it and tuning it down. I think what's important to point out about this system is it involves a lot of different neurotransmitters and it has far-reaching effects on pleasure, mood, pain, appetite, motivation, and memory. So you can listen to this thinking of effects of THC too. So they're clearly working in the same areas. Uh, the analogy that I like the best is, you know, if anandamide is a scalpel that's fine-tuning kind of neuronal homeostasis, scalpel, have that in your head, THC is a sledgehammer. So it's that scalpel sledgehammer. Um, I will tell you that THC has a greater affinity for these receptors, it sticks around longer. So if someone is particularly a regular marijuana user, then this is gonna interfere with the normal functioning of this system. There's also a lot of really good science emerging that this system is involved in brain development. And so this is where I start feeling like we're connecting all the dots that this system is working on brain development, THC we know impacts adolescent brain development, and there's your connection. And we know that there are cannabinoid receptors even in the fetus, and so this may start right at the beginning of life. All right, so my next section is we're gonna look at four myths that I'm sure you're all familiar with, and then we'll go over why those aren't the case. It's interesting, my first version of this talk, I actually had them listed as myths, and I really enjoyed kind of the power of showing these myths. But then Sharon Levy, who's our medical director, looked at the slides and said, the risk is if someone is kind of dozing and they kind of see your slide and they have this subliminal recollection of it, they might remember it as the myth and, and be confused. So she said, state, you know, show the facts, but describe the myths. So that's the method to my madness. So um, the first myth is that marijuana is harmless. The second myth is that marijuana is not addictive. The third myth is that marijuana does not impact driving. And then the fourth myth is marijuana is a medication. All right, so let's, let's address the health effects first. I did send you all an article, I think it went out yesterday, published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2014. Nora Volkow, who's the head of NIDA, National Institute of Drug Abuse, um, wrote a beautiful summary with her colleagues of adverse health effects. I realize now it's five years old, but I still think it's one of the best summaries out there. Really kind of the state of the art. This is what we know, this is what we think. So I'd encourage all of you to read that article and really feel facile um, talking about those points with your families, your patients. So first zeroing in on the effects of short-term use, um, we do know that marijuana affects short-term memory and attention. And I like to point out that the developmental task of adolescents is to learn. You know, they're learning in school, they're learning on a job. And so we know that clearly um, this short-term effect of marijuana will impact them and it does linger. So even if, you know, maybe they've used during their school day or before school, maybe they've used a couple of days ago, but the effect is gonna stick around. I mentioned effects on motor coordination. I want you to think about athletes in your practice and also driving, which is a really important point. Um, as other psychoactive drugs do, we know that marijuana impairs judgment, and so this alone will put adolescents at risk for doing all sorts of high-risk behaviors, including sexual behaviors. And we also know that in high doses, marijuana can cause paranoia and even frank psychosis. So this slide is more of an emphasis on the long-term effects. We talked about the short-term effects. These are more of the long-term effects. And the authors, this is also from that New England Journal of, pa uh, of Medicine paper, you can see the asterisk on the bottom, which is this effect is strongly associated with marijuana use in adolescence. And so I've gone ahead, the red box is mine because that's who we're thinking about today. So uh, we know that marijuana can be addictive. I'm gonna talk about that more in a minute. 
generally the number that's out there for everyone, all comers 12 and up, is that about 9% of users who experiment with marijuana will become addicted. We know that if you zero in on adolescents, on users who start um, any time in adolescence, that number doubles to about 17%. And it's also worth noting that if you zero in on the daily users, I think this is intuitive as well, that about 25 to 50% of daily users are going to demonstrate that they're addicted. We know that marijuana causes effects on brain development. I want you to think about this endocannabinoid system and what it's supposed to be doing. Um, we, we also have seen that marijuana is associated with poor educational outcome. We see this in our practice all the time. And kind of the worst case scenario would be school dropout. <laughs> We're going to talk about cognitive impairment in just a minute. And I always like lingering on this effect that um, over time, marijuana users report diminished life satisfaction and achievement. I think we don't think about a lot of qualitative measures in medicine, but that really jumps out at me as something we should be thinking about. This is a very nice study also to be familiar with so you can discuss it with your patients or parents uh, would be interested in this. This was published in 2012. Um, persistent cannabis users show neuropsychological decline from childhood to midlife. How many people are familiar with this study? A change in IQ. Okay, a couple of hands. So what the investigators did is they followed a birth cohort in Dunedin, New Zealand. They had an N of about 1,000 patients and they did neuropsychological testing at age 13, and then they repeated it at age 38. And what they did in between is at uh, periodic time points, they would assess for what was then called marijuana dependence. We've changed the terminology, but you know they were looking for individuals with use consistent with a cannabis use disorder. And what they found that was super interesting is for um, individuals who hadn't used marijuana, IQ was stable over time, which is what we would expect. For um, the heavier marijuana users, they were able to demonstrate an IQ drop of between six to eight points. And what was really interesting, which I'm not showing you on this slide, is that this really was limited to individuals who use marijuana and met criteria for cannabis dependence when they were adolescents. So if someone started using marijuana in their late 20s, they were not going to be in this subgroup that demonstrated a change in IQ. So I love this study. I think it really speaks to this vulnerability or susceptibility of the adolescent brain. There are a lot more anatomical studies that are being reported. I think there's real interest in looking anatomically to see if we can identify differences. Um, what you're looking at is a picture of the corpus callosum. I had to look this up for medical school, but it's the largest white matter tract in the brain that connects the hemispheres. And what I hope you can appreciate is you see thinning of the corpus callosum in the daily marijuana user, so you can actually appreciate anatomical changes compared to a healthy non-user. And what's super interesting is that this is similar to what we see in the brains of individuals with schizophrenia. So I think we're going to put this together over the next few years, but there's something there. You know, there's something, a way that marijuana affects brain connectivity is the phrase that's often used. I think that's a good segue to what's emerging in the psychiatric literature. We know that there's an increased risk of psychosis in um, regular or heavy marijuana users. I think what we understand the best is for individuals with a susceptibility. So typically that would be someone with a family member who has schizophrenia. You know, they have some increased predisposition for a psychotic disorder. It has been shown that for those patients, regular marijuana use will increase the likelihood that they will develop this disorder, it will come earlier, it will be more severe. So there's definitely, again, something there, some link with psychotic disorders. We know that if, if we're meeting a patient in ASAP and we find out that there's a family history of schizophrenia, we will consider it urgent to talk to them about how they should really stop marijuana use right away. That's how we're using it in the day-to-day. -day. In the interest of time, I'm going to go quickly on a couple of these slides. Cardiologists are trying to figure out whether there are long-term risks to marijuana use. There's some suggestion that there's going to be something there. Um, we already talked about cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. This was an article describing it in the New York Times. I really like this slide. This was given to me by someone at ASAP who had done expert work in the Boston Medical Center ED, and she would talk to adolescents about substance use, and this was her visual. And I think visuals work really well for kids. So this uh, shows marijuana's effects on various parts of the body. And again, I think a picture is worth a thousand words. 
all right, so I can't show you the myth. I'm showing you the fact. But remember, there's the sense that marijuana isn't addictive, and I'm here saying, yes, it is. One of the ways that we look at that is that clearly adolescents who are presenting for substance use treatment, uh, marijuana is always a significant part of their presentation. We know that um, from data from 2017, if you look at 12 to 14 year olds presenting for treatment, 70% will be, marijuana will be an important part of their presentation and the number is similar for slightly older adolescents. This is a really important principle. I think we reviewed it in September. The idea is that the earlier one initiates use of a substance, the more likely they are to have a problem. And that's really true across the board. We know that's true for marijuana. And I remember saying to this group before that if you take it on as an intervention to delay initiation in your patients, that's a very powerful intervention for this reason. Uh, one of the reasons people don't think marijuana is addictive is that the withdrawal syndrome is less well known. You know, we all know about the opioid withdrawal symptom syndrome, but I'm here to say that there is a bona fide marijuana withdrawal syndrome. It's been described in the DSM-5. Generally, the top of the list for symptoms are mood symptoms. You know, these patients who have tried to quit are irritable, they're angry, they're aggressive, they're restless. You just you just don't feel well, and the mood symptoms are on the top of the list. It's funny because we have a lot of patients who will go on vacation with their families. They won't have access to marijuana, and then this is how they are for the whole vacation. Uh, we also know there are appetite effects. Oftentimes, uh, patients lose their appetite. Sleep disturbances are very common. Um, in the literature, it says that vivid and disturbing dreams are often seen. I've had patients tell me that. Um, and really the primary significance of this syndrome is that patients who are trying to quit don't feel well and they go back to using. So that's why it's so such an important set of symptoms. All right, let's talk a little bit about the driving, um, driving use. Again, I think uh, patients, there's an urban myth out there that marijuana does not affect their driving. I've had patients say to me that they are better drivers after using marijuana. So it, it's something we need to get a lot of education out there. This picture should look familiar, except instead of showing you purple dots, I'm showing you parts of the brain by region that uh, are bind binding to THC and hence are affected by it. So you'll see coordination, vision, sensations, movement, judgment. Um, Bill talked to us about the reward pathway. So all of these regions of the brain are impacted by marijuana. So uh, people have done studies using driving simulation techniques. Uh, we have a lot of good data explaining what we're seeing. Um, so when you have acute marijuana use, you have, I actually just learned this, you have a decrease in peripheral vision. And as I was driving here, I was doing a little experiment saying, what would my driving be like if I had no peripheral vision? It's kind of an interesting exercise for me. Uh, we talked about the effects on motor coordination increase in reaction time, and then this whole altered sense of time. Remember, we've talked about that, and so you don't have a good sense of time and distance. And think about how important that is in driving. So we're looking for authoritative statistics. I think the number that you can have in your head is generally someone who's um, intoxicated with marijuana has about a twice the risk of having an accident. Um, looking at accident culpability analysis the number can be a little higher. So just think of it as somewhere in that range of two to seven times higher risk. Uh, one of the things that's interesting is um, THC can primarily impair automatic driving function. So you have the typical stoner who's um, driving and they can try to compensate. You know, this is the person who's stopping at all the green lights because they know they're impaired and they're trying to make up for it. What's very important is that um, alcohol has a very different effect on driving and it impairs the tasks requiring conscious control. So where am I going with this when you have the combination on board? That's really bad news because you lose the ability to compensate uh, in a way that you might if it's just THC. So if you've used a little marijuana and a little alcohol, that's much more dangerous synergistically than that amount, either one by itself. So something to keep in mind. Sometimes at parties, kids are using marijuana and alcohol. So we are waiting with bated breath to see what data we're going to get as more states legalize marijuana. What, what's this going to look like? This is some data from Colorado um, looking at 2010, which is when the dispensaries opened their doors. Um, marijuana was more available and we saw a sharp uptick in fatal crash drivers testing positive for marijuana. So we're, we're waiting for data from the last few years to see what, what this actually looks like. But that's a suggestion that it's not good. I'm going to skip that slide. 
Um, this is another important point. So this looks at cannabinol involvement in fatally injured drivers by year and age group. Cannabinol is one of the cannabinoids, so it's used as an index of marijuana use. You can see that, A, there's been an increase um, in drivers, fatally injured drivers testing positive, and you can see that our age group is really the top of the chart. This is where we're seeing the biggest impact. All right, uh, I always enjoy talking about this. So you have this phrase out there, medical marijuana. So people are thinking of marijuana as a medication. I love this slide. This was given to me by Scott Hadland, who's now at Boston Medical Center. Um, I like looking at the poster on the right, on your right, which is this young man holding a sign, cannabis, gateway to good health. You know, there's a lot of messaging out there. And, and just the phrase medical marijuana, you have medical and marijuana in juxtaposition. So people are getting this message subliminally or fully consciously that marijuana is good for you. I think it's interesting. It's always good to think about the history of how this evolved. This really, the story started in 1990 when the Institute of Medicine approved what was considered the compassionate use of marijuana in a very specific set of patients, in terminally ill patients, the idea, the idea being to relieve suffering. So really as part of a palliative care package. Um, California went many steps further uh, a few years later in 1996 when it became the first state to pass a medical marijuana ballot initiative. And what was really interesting about that step forward or backward, depending on how you look at it, is that the number of conditions that were considered appropriate for marijuana as medical grew, grew exponentially. And so suddenly there was a whole list of conditions that were considered appropriate for medical marijuana. Other highlights along the years, there was a very influential documentary on CNN in 2013 looking at this phenomenon of medical marijuana. It was a lot of emphasis on seizures in children and the effects of marijuana. And this was kind of sent a very positive message to um, the world at large. And so fast forward now, just remember my green map that I showed at the beginning of this talk. I think what the most important point that you should hear from me today is that uh, we just don't have an evidence base for the use of marijuana given this way, for the use of this phrase, medical marijuana. Probably the evidence is most robust for patients with cancer who are undergoing chemotherapy who have really refractory nausea and vomiting. Typically, these are patients who've tried the more conventional agents, nothing is working, and um, there's some evidence that marijuana in that context has an effect. I think second on the list in terms of an evidence base would be patients with wasting syndromes. Traditionally, this has been HIV and AIDS patients. A lot of the other indications that are kind of bandied about for medical marijuana, there just is not an, a research base to support that. I like this slide. I, like, I enjoy showing this. Um, so for those of you who know the history of medicine, we know that penicillin was initially isolated for moldy bread. The analogy I'd like to leave you with is if you had a patient in your office with an otitis media, you would give them a pharmaceutical product, you would give them penicillin, you wouldn't give them moldy bread. So I think sending someone to a dispensary for marijuana is really your moldy bread example. And I think the correlate of that is, you know, we talked about all the cannabinoid compounds in marijuana, and there certainly is a burgeoning body of evidence that some of these compounds do have important pharmaceutical properties. So I'm not trying to, what's the expression, throw away the baby with the bathwater. But I think the pathway that we should be thinking of is rigorous identification of these cannabinoid compounds. They should be studied, FDA approved, and then prescribed to patients. So that's the way to go, and that's the way to think about this. There are a handful of pharmaceutical cannabinoids already out there. Marinol was the first. This is synthetic THC. Um, and this was first approved by the FDA in 1985 for nausea and vomiting, again, for patients undergoing chemotherapy, and then also for patients with wasting syndromes. Sativex is in other countries. And again, this is usually given as a spray. It's a mixture of cannabis plant extracts. And this has been shown to have some effect for primarily multiple sclerosis. Um, so cannabidiol, obviously everyone knows there's a huge craze going around right now. This is CBD. Um, we know this is the second most common cannabinoid in cannabis. It is not psychoactive. Uh, and we do know that this possesses strong anticonvulsant properties. There was a very big New England Journal of Medicine paper published in 2017 looking at children with severe epilepsy, some of these severe congenital forms that were um, refractory to all other treatment, and this seemed to work. 
So this resulted in a new pharmaceutical product, a, a Pidiolex, uh, that is CBD. So again, I think the message is there is a therapeutic potential for uh, these pharmaceutical cannabinoids, and that's the way that we should be going about thinking of it. If you look at column on the left, column on the right, cannabinoids are pharmaceutical products. Medical marijuana at the end of the day is a plant. Um, we're looking for products that are regulated by the FDA. Medical marijuana is something that's been decided by popular vote. Um, these products are typically given by oral or by spray. I always make the point that I think it's unconscionable for physicians to recommend something that's given by smoking because we know that smoking is harmful. We know that vaping is harmful. So that can't be how a physician prescribes something to a patient. Um, the language is interesting. Cannabinoids can be prescribed in the conventional manner. Um, medical marijuana is recommended. Has, has everyone heard that word? You wouldn't say I'm going to prescribe medical marijuana, and that harkens back to the fact that under federal law, marijuana is still an illegal substance, so it couldn't be prescribed. So they use the language of recommended. So I'm going to just do a quick survey of what we're learning from states that have really kind of gone down this path ahead of Massachusetts. I like talking about Colorado. Um, generally, they approved medical marijuana in the early 2000s, and then the dispensaries opened their doors in 2010. So what you can see, um, this is interest or number of applications for medical marijuana card in Colorado. You can see that it was kind of status quo until the dispensaries opened their doors, and then the interest skyrocketed. So that's really when this uh, phenomena catapulted. Uh, at some point, I will go into a dispensary. I haven't, um, as of yet, one of these pot shops, but this is a picture taken from Colorado. Um, I think there's a lot of messaging in the advertising. This is how medical marijuana is advertised. Scantily clad blonde women is, you know, that's what's selling the product. Now, and if you look, generally this is from Colorado, but I think this trend is similar. If you look at holders of medical marijuana cards, what are the indications? It turns out that, a, you know, a fraction, a tiny percent on the order of 2% would be um, having a medical marijuana card for some of the more well-studied indications, such as cancer or AIDS. Um, a lot of times it would be this wastebasket diagnosis of chronic pain. And depending on the prescriber or recommender, that can really just, you know, be this wastebasket term. All right, so again, we do have data. Um, Colorado has given us a long history to think about this. Um, they passed recreational marijuana in 2012, and then I remember the news on January 1st, 2014, when the stores opened their doors. There was a significant increase in car, car crashes seen in the early months of 2014. Um, we know that medical marijuana gets in the hands of adolescents. That really is not a subtle point. There was a study in Colorado that showed that um, really three quarters of adolescents in substance use treatment were saying that they had gotten medical marijuana from someone else and not just once, but any number of times. I think we have to think about all of the downstream effects. What are we going to see? And again, I said I would raise questions at the end of the talk. Um, this is uh, a study that showed that there was an increase in drug related suspensions in Colorado, again, tracking with this introduction of dispensaries. Uh, so we are seeing more edibles. Um, this is really a problem. And what I mentioned before is that medical marijuana is often put in food that would be appealing to anyone, including toddlers. So you can see where I'm going with this. Um, Colorado reported a significant increase in emergency department visits for young children who had um, accidentally eaten one of these products and developed marijuana intoxication. There's also a phenomenon in pets. Um, and I hear this all the time, where the pet ate the brownies that were on the kitchen counter. And I even heard that in the news last night about a, a dog presenting for care. We don't know what secondhand smoke, what the effects are. I think this is an area that's going to be actively studied. And the idea is that as marijuana becomes more widely used, what does that mean for um, children who are exposed to passive smoke? And we, we know that this endocannabinoid system is involved in brain development, so our, our concern is real about this issue. One of the points I like to make is that um, we are really looking at a new tobacco industry. It's, it's one of those feelings of deja vu that the cannabis industry is really um, emulating or copying what the tobacco industry did. 
Dr. Levy, who's our medical director, published an article in the New England Journal a few years ago, which is a great read if, if any of you would like to read it, looking at the history of the tobacco industry and why it looks like the cannabis industry is poised to go down the same path. Again, interesting history in the 1880s, very little by way of tobacco products. Fast forward to the 1950s, that was really the peak when half the population used tobacco, and this was mostly in the form of uh, cigarette smoking. And then there's my picture from, I think, 1964 of the Surgeon General holding up the first published report describing the link between smoking and lung cancer. So it really took decades for this to evolve. And meanwhile, the tobacco industry was very good at what it did. You know, it achieved its success through product development, marketing, and lobbying. And we were already seeing this really well underway with the cannabis industry. We've talked to you about how the product is evolving. When I talk about how the potency has increased, that's deliberate. That's to sell more product. This is not kind of a random um, numbers game. New delivery devices are being introduced. You know, that's what Bill was talking to you about. And, um, and this is, again, the same thing that we witnessed with the tobacco industry. I think marketing is going to be harder to contain on the Internet. I don't know what that's going to look like. Um, so here's an example of a couple of ads lifted. Um, so we talked about potency, so pure cannabis oils, 100%. Um, and then the appeal of these products are because they're so potent, you don't need a large amount to get high. Kids are saying this, you know, for kids, this is economical. If I, if I buy a really potent product, I can use less and it costs me less than using what they call traditional flour. Reduces exposure to other toxins. Well, I think we'll see about that. Um, everyone wants in on the action, you know, so here's... Um, Maybe I'm not supposed to say skinny girl is working on a strain that doesn't cause the munchies. So everyone, it's like cartoons where the characters have dollar signs in their eyeballs. And again, I think Bill made this point really well. We're seeing this with marijuana products as well, that it's really not subtle who the intended targets are for this marketing. I know my kids used to love ring pops. So I present you with ring pots, pot tarts. Um, you know, it, it's really not subtle. So it's this sense of deja vu again as we think about Joe Camel. Um, so I'd encourage all of you to read the policy statement that was published by the AAP in 2015. I did send you an article on counseling your families about marijuana use, and it refers to this policy statement. So you'll have almost read it by reading the other article I sent you. Um, so the AAP in their policy statement clearly came down in opposition of legalization of marijuana. And, and their, their stance is we just need to see the effects of these recent laws, and we need to answer that million-dollar question, which is how is this going to impact on children and adolescents? Um, there was an article Dr. Levy published on building a learning marijuana surveillance system. I think we just need to be able to measure over time all of the downstream effects of marijuana use and figure out you know, how things are changing with the changing landscape, as I introduced it in the beginning. All right, so I'm just going to introduce a couple of cases just so you can think about what cases look like who come to ASAP, um, and then I'm happy to linger for questions. So this is based on an actual case. Adam is a 15-year-old high school freshman. Uh, he has a diagnosis and a history of generalized anxiety disorder since early elementary school. He's a very talented musician, and I think because of his music, he's often in circles with older kids. He started using marijuana sporadically at first in eighth grade, quickly became a daily user, uh, he uses smoke marijuana and also kind of hiding in plain sight. He uses a dab pen in his home. He also has some dabbling with other substances. He's tried shrooms, Xanax. Um, meanwhile, his mom is very concerned about his anxiety. For a while last year, he w was refusing to go to school because of his anxiety. So she finally got him in to see a psychiatrist who prescribed fluoxetine, and Adam refused to take it. And I hear this over and over again, typically from the younger kids who come to see me, that marijuana is natural, it's plant-based, and he's going to go with that, not some of these kind of suspicious pharmaceutical products. Um, Meanwhile, family history is important. Parents are divorced. Father has a history of bipolar disorder and a lengthy history of substance use for years. So how would you think about this case? We'll just do a couple of shout outs and I'll show you one more case before we end. What, what jumps out at you? And have you, met, have you met Adam in your practice? Lots of yeses, lots of we sure have. So because I'm almost out of time, again, these are kind of teasers or chasers just so you can have a sense of what we're seeing. 
So the point, the points that I made is I thought about this case is, you know, as you're approaching how to, how to treat his marijuana use, you've got to address the generalized anxiety disorder. Otherwise, that's clearly going to get in the way. And then I wrote to myself, easier said than done. Um, genetic loading is important. You know, this kid obviously has a genetic susceptibility because his father had a severe substance use disorder, especially with our younger kids. A lot of the work that we can do is with the parents. So it's, it's sort of hard to budge Adam because he feels strongly about what he does. So we have parents that come in for appointments separately and we try to devise a behavior contract or approaches where they can impact on Adam's behavior if he's in that stance where he won't budge. And that's typically how we, how we shift things like that. Cindy is a very typical case for us. She's a junior at boarding school. Um, she got in trouble last spring for having a jewel on school grounds. So uh, the school was actually very supportive, but they did say, we'd like you to get some sort of substance use treatment. So she came to ASAP late spring, early summer. Um, when we got our thorough history, she is a regular marijuana user, more when she's home than when she's at school because she doesn't want to get into trouble at school for marijuana use, but she comes home you know, very frequently. And so for her presentation, she's super committed to stop using an e-cigarette. I think we used her, um, the media approaches us from time to time because they want to talk to adolescents. And so she was someone we approached about talking to the media because she really wanted to stop using her jewel, but wouldn't even really discuss the marijuana use because she doesn't see it as a problem. Remember, we went over stages of change, so she would be a pre-contemplative patient. So I think, again, you, you're going to see this patient as well. I think you've got one foot in the door because you want to engage her, particularly with um, all the things that Bill talked about. There's a lot of work to be done with her nicotine use disorder. And then you would do a lot of motivational interviewing to try to get her to, to kind of start seeing her marijuana use as problematic in the way that she already sees her nicotine use. All right, I'll just finish with Luke. Um, this is kind of a sad patient. Luke is a 15-year-old living with a guardian. His biological father died of a heroin overdose when he was little, and his mother is currently living in a sober house in Connecticut. Uh, they're in touch via social media. He's really not ready to see her more regularly. He's a heavy marijuana user at age 15. He uses a dab pen. I always ask kids on a scale of 1 to 10, how willing are you to stop? 1 would be not at all. 10 would be... Um, yes, willing. I got a negative 10,000 the other day. I thought that was kind of cool. So, you know, Luke was classically a one, not at all willing, um, but he's really annoyed that he has to come to ASAP. So he's made a little bit of a modification just so he could stop coming to see us. No history of other substance use at this point. And he has a very significant psychiatric history. He's been diagnosed with major depression, generalized anxiety, PTSD, really from his years of living with his mom uh, in very troubled circumstances and ADHD. There is a therapist, thankfully, who's very involved. Um, she's interested in doing trauma work, but when she kind of goes near there, he shuts down. So she hasn't been able to it yet. This is another example of what you might see in your practice. Again, I want you to always think about genetic loading. You're going to worry more about the same individual with a positive genetic history than that same story in someone who does not. Obviously, the elephant in the room is this mental health history. Um, kids with trauma histories, it's often harder to get them to stop using marijuana. I'm not advocating marijuana use for trauma, but it does get complicated. So you want to kind of monitor them very carefully as they become abstinent. And again, the parent work is going to be essential. All right, I'm going to stop now. It looks like we're just out of time, and I will certainly linger for questions. Thank you. There's one final word I just want to say. One of the resources we'll be sharing with you is an absolutely great uh, bibliography and sort of survey of the literature that Bill and some others at ASAP were involved in about CBD. It's really, uh, it'll be a great re resource for you guys and lots more to follow. Mimi, there's a question from online. This was from earlier. Sure. Um, how do you wean off THC? Okay, so repeating the question, how do you wean off THC? Um, we don't have a medication. There have been a lot of medications that have been tried, and nothing is really robust in the literature. So uh, we usually recommend abstinence. Um, I don't have a great medication to treat the withdrawal symptoms that I talked to you about. Um, we have some kids who cut back. You know, if there's someone who's willing to stop abruptly, I would support that. And then I would just give them as much psychosocial support around the withdrawal symptoms. Uh, there aren't a lot of kids who come to us saying, I want to stop, can you help me? It's not really the conversation, but I don't have a medication to offer. A lot of it is just incentivizing and supporting around the stopping. 
great. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. <laughs> Any other questions from online or in the room? Okay, if anything comes up, feel free to email me, um, jane.bittner at childrens.harvard.edu. Um, I'll send her on the slides and the after session survey. Um, other than that, thanks so much everyone for joining us and have a great morning. Bye-bye.